This is a study of the human skull. And in this part of our lecture, I will introduce the skull to you and we'll talk about a portion of the skull called the cranium. So, let's first remind ourselves that skeletal features are always important landmarks to finding softer tissues in the human body. And the images that you see here are pointing out a number of the features that you will learn in this lecture and that become very, very important if you're in a medical setting. So the first thing we want to know about the cranium or the, about the skull is that we can divide it into three groups of bones. Um, if you have the handout from our class that lists the bones and the features that you need to know, you can see that these are also grouped. And so the first section, the first group of bones is the cranium. There are eight bones that form the cranium and the skull. The cranium can be described as the brain case. These are the eight bones of the skull that completely enclose and surround the brain and protect it and isolate it from the rest of the human body. What's great about these eight bones is that if you have already learned the lobes of the cerebrum, you know the names of six out of the eight of these bones. So hopefully you've already had a study of the brain and the nervous system, and if so, um, you'll find this part easy. Otherwise, you'll, you'll learn the bones, and then if you study the nervous system later, um, you'll find that the names of these bones help you to learn lobes of the cerebrum. So, cranium has eight bones. If we take the facial features out, as you see in this diagram, then basically the bones that we're left with here are the bones of the cranium. So, eight bones there. There are 14 bones in the facial structure, and let's mask the cranium. And so the bones that you see here are the facial bones. Um, there are not 14 names to learn because the majority of the bones in the facial area are paired, meaning there is a right one and a left one that are sutured together to form that structure of the face. And these bones, of course, include the two jaws. So eight bones in the cranium, 14 bones in the face. There are six other bones, and these are called the ossicles. These are the tiniest, tiniest bones in the human body. And so my question right off would be, do you know where the tiniest bones in the human body are? And if you guessed the ear, that is correct. Six bones, three in each ear. If you look right in the center of this diagram, you see three little bones suspended in the middle section of the ear. Those three little bones transmit vibrations from the eardrum into the actual neural apparatus of the ear. How tiny are these bones? Well, here's a good example. Here's um, comparing them to the size of the smallest United States coin, the dime. And so these are full-fledged bones, cancellous bone, compact bone, um, all the nature of a bone, and yet so, so tiny. So six of those. So we have eight bones in the cranium, 14 bones in the face, these six little ossicles, for a total of 28 bones that make up the human skull. Now, even if you've studied those 28 bones, if you knew these 28 bones well, there is still one other bone that we should make note of. Um, in my class, we have studied all of the other bones of the human body thus far. And so we've, we're now studying the head and the neck, and the skull uh, forms the bones um, of the head and neck as do the cervical vertebra, but we've already studied the vertebral columns, so we know those. But there's still one last bone that every student of human anatomy should know. This bone is called the hyoid bone, 
and it's located in the neck. If you look at the picture on your left, you can see that bone in its shape, and you can see that it's very intimately attached to the larynx. There is a membrane of connective tissue that links this hyoid bone to the thyroid cartilage of the larynx. And one of the things we know about the larynx is that it moves during vocalizing and during swallowing. Um, when we studied the respiratory system, we put our fingers on there and gave a big swallow, and you could feel the whole larynx rise up. Well, of course, it takes muscles to do that. And uh, later in our unit studying the head and the neck, we will study muscles in the neck area that both raise and lower or elevate and depress the hyoid bone. And as that hyoid bone moves, the larynx moves with it. The hyoid bone is a much better attachment site for muscles than the hyaline cartilage of the larynx would be. So in our study, there will be eight muscles, four above the hyoid bone, four below the hyoid bone, and those muscles will elevate and depress that, and the larynx will basically go along for the ride. Of those eight muscles, six are attached to the hyoid bone. There are two that are directly attached to the cartilage, um, but the hyoid bone makes a much better attachment site. If you look at an x-ray, it's something that's often overlooked, but you can see the hyoid bone located right here in the neck below the jaw. So every student should know that there is a bone in your neck. If you put your fingers right above your thyroid cartilage in your neck and sort of pinch and rub them up and down, you may be able to feel those long projections of the hyoid bone. Those projections are called the horns or the cornu. Older term is cornu. Current terms are horns, and you can see the two little lesser horns near the body of it, and those long projecting pieces are the greater horns. In my class, my students don't need to, to learn those necessarily, but you should know the hyoid bone, and you should know where it's connected, and you should know um, what its purpose is there in, uh, in helping to move the larynx. So there's the hyoid bone, and back to the skull. So there are 28 bones in the skull, we're going to focus our study on the 22 bones here, and we'll study the ossicles later when we study the ear. So we'll focus on these 22. In this lecture, I'm going to deal with the cranial bones, and you'll find a second lecture that specifically deals with the facial bones. So let's, let's cover the eight cranial bones. Bone right here over the forehead is the frontal bone. And being that it's in front, I guess that makes sense. So let's talk about other features of the frontal bone. Obviously, your entire forehead is frontal bone. Your eyebrows, uh, not the hairy brows themselves, but the bony ridge that runs above your eye sockets. And we should put a name to the eye sockets here, too. Um, the eye sockets of the skull are called the orbits of the skull, and you should know that. Any object that is associated with the eye socket will be called orbital. Uh, for example, those eyebrow ridges are known as the supraorbital margins. So right away from supraorbital, you get above the eye socket and the margin would be the edge, so that prominent edge above the eye sockets is the supraorbital margin. So make sure you know the term orbit as it relates to the eye socket. And here in this picture we can see that the frontal bone uh, sweeps in and forms the ceiling of those two eye cavities. So. One of the great things about the pictures that we're looking at here is you can see that each bone has been colored a different color. And so 
we're going to look at a number of different pictures showing the structure of the skull, and we can follow the bones from picture to picture by following the color. For example, let's take the skull and turn it so that we're looking down on it from a superior aspect. And so you can see here is the frontal bone again, looking at it from above. Behind it are the two parietal bones. And you can see that there's a suture running right down the midline of the skull. And so we have two bones with the same name, a right parietal bone and a left parietal bone, whereas the frontal bone is a single bone. And there will be times all the way through our study of the skull we'll, where we will refer to paired bones and unpaired bones. And so make sure you can distinguish that. Uh, make sure you can remember that. Um, in the skull, we have two pairs of unpaired bones, but in the face, we have six. So, or yeah, there's, uh, or I'm sorry, there's two unpaired bones, six paired bones in the face, two unpaired bones. So uh, frontal is unpaired, one and only one, and two parietal bones. Just as an aside, one of the interesting things about the frontal bone, though, is that it does develop in the womb as two separate bones, um, very much like the parietal bones. And yet something in the genetic code tells those two um, pieces of bone in the frontal area to unite and to completely join as one, whereas the two parietal bones remain separate. So one frontal bone, two parietal bones, and then you can see a little bit of purple bone in the posterior part of the skull, and that, of course, is the occipital bone. Let's rotate the skull again so that we're looking at the skull directly from behind, a posterior view. So here's a great view of our occipital bone. You can see that it forms the entire posterior part of the skull. If you put your hand on the back of your head, you're touching the occipital bone. And if you run it down uh, the back part of your skull and find where it dives in under into the neck, right at that turning point and right in the center, you should be able to feel a lump of bone. That lump is known as the external occipital protuberance protrudes. Um, and then down below on the inferior part of this occipital bone, you can see two occipital condyles. Notice those two oval features on either side of the opening. Those are the occipital condyles, and they fit right down into the superior articular facets of the atlas, the first vertebra. Between those two occipital condyles is the foramen magnum, and of course, the foramen magnum is the opening where the brain and the spinal cord um, are united. The spinal cord and the brain stem of the brain are one and the same, and they project through that hole. Let's turn the skull one more time and look at it from below. And so here is the skull from below. And you clearly see that foramen magnum right there in the center. And if you look to the right and left of it, uh, those oval features are the occipital condyles. And those are what fit into the atlas. Uh, the other thing to notice about the occipital bone is how it wedges toward the face. It becomes narrower and narrower and narrower. And on either side of that are the two yellow bones. And those two bones are, of course, of course, called the temporal bones. And uh, the area that's circled here has a number of openings on it that allow blood vessels to get into and out of the skull. And uh, at least on our list of bone features that you should recognize, the temporal bone has the most features of any other bone. Um, so I can see the yellow bone here wedging in next to the occipital bone. Um, one of the things on the occipital bone is notice that there is a piece of an arch reaching over toward the face. 
a green bone in the face. We haven't named it yet, but you can see there's a projection from the temporal bone that reaches over that way. And here is that side view. And again, you can see that projection of the temporal bone going up toward the face. That is an arch of bone. <clears throat> There's a skinny little bony feature sticking down called the styloid process, uh, an important muscle attachment site, as is the mastoid process, which is that very large lump right behind the ear. And uh, the little hole that you see between and above the styloid and the mastoid processes is the ear canal, or what is referred to as the external auditory meatus. Some books will call it the eternal, external acoustic meatus. Both acoustic and auditory make reference to hearing, and so that is the canal where sound waves enter the skull to meet those three little ossicles in each ear. The other object of note here is that the jaw, the only synovial joint in the skull, is jointed from the lower jaw into the temporal bone as well. It's known as the temporomandibular joint, named for the two bones that meet. So here is the two temporal bones. So we found the frontal bone, the two parietal bones, the single occipital bone, and the two temporal bones. There are six out of the eight bones. And you can see they cover the front, top, back, sides, and underside of the brain. Now there are two other bones, but these bones are very difficult to see and describe. Um, in this picture you can see one of them. <clears throat> it's the orange bone. Look to the orange color here. And you can see it's located behind the face. It's going to be part of what surrounds the brain, but it's located deep in under the face, so it's a very difficult bone to describe. Probably the best view of it is to cut through the skull horizontally, what would be a transverse cut, open the top of the skull, and actually look down into where the brain would be sitting. When we do, this is the kind of view that we have. And uh, the bone that we're trying to describe here is called the sphenoid bone. The sphenoid bone, and you see it here in orange. Uh, some people describe it shaped like a butterfly or a bat. And in case uh, you have a list of features, you typically would find both greater wings and lesser wings being specific features of this bone. On the left side of the image here, you can see in gray at the top three little representations of where the bone is. Um, in the colored picture, you can see that it sits anterior to the occipital and the two temporal bones, purple and yellow. It sits behind or posterior to the frontal bone, which you can see occupies most of the anterior part of the skull, the purple bone there. Uh, and so it just fits right behind the face and right into that space between all the other bones here. The two views of it separately to the left, one is a superior view, so it's in the same position that you see it in the skull. In fact, let me slide it over here. So you can see, looking at it separately, this is what it looks like. And the picture below is a posterior view. So if you can imagine rotating that so that you've turned it, and you can see it from behind instead of from above, um, much of what you see there is the same. But notice the two long features that are hanging down. Those are actually hanging down on either side of the na posterior nasal apertures. If you can imagine yourself being back in the throat area and looking into the nasal cavity from behind, you would see these two bony features of the sphenoid bone um, reaching down, sort of forming doorposts on either side of the posterior nasal apertures. Now, the sphenoid bone is significant because a very important part of the brain 
sits right in this area. And not a bad idea here if you do know the brain already, or you will be, if you haven't learned it yet, if you're in another human anatomy class, you will be learning it at some point. But the sphenoid bone is right in the center of the skull. And if we look at a brain like this, um, you'll notice what's right in the center of the brain there is the hypothalamic area. Um, the uh, pituitary gland is there, the optic chiasm. Let's kind of illustrate this um, with a more colorful picture. The yellow features there are the optic nerves running into the optic chiasm. You can see a little bit of the optic tracts running back into the brain. The pituitary gland right in the middle near that optic chiasm and the two little mammillary bodies. Now match what you see there with what we were looking at, looking down into the skull, and you can see how all of that fits. The only thing we're missing in the brain picture here is the cerebellum. That's obviously been cut off. But if you were to put the brain, the brain is upside down now, but if you put it right side up and set it down into that, into the skull, you could see where each part of it fits. Um, and notice that we can take the skull and divide it internally into three cranial fossa, or fossae, pl plural. Uh, the anterior cranial fossa is the shelf-like area, in the anterior part on which the frontal bone sits. Um, those two optic nerves and the eyes are going to be under that anterior cranial fossa. And right behind that blue, I think you can see right in the center, two small holes that are leading into the orbits, and the two optic nerves extend into the orbits there. The middle cranial fossa are the two side pockets, and these are, of course, for the two temporal lobes of the brain. Perhaps you can picture those two thumb-like pieces of the brain fitting down into the side chambers. And the hypothalamus then sits right over that little area right in the middle. The middle cranial fossa includes a little hollowed out area right in the center, which houses and protects the pituitary gland. If you've seen the pictures of the brain with the pituitary hanging down from the infundibulum. Uh, the infundibulum is hardly strong enough to hold it, but because the pituitary sits down in this little chamber, uh, the infundibulum helps to maintain the link between the brain and the and the pituitary gland. And then immediately behind the two middle, or behind the middle cranial fossa, uh, are two sort of mountain ranges. You can see those two diagonal sharp edges. And then you drop down into a very deep posterior cranial fossa. And this, of course, is where the cerebellum sits from the brain. So please be able to recognize the three cranial fossa and we'll be referring to various features in each of those three locations. So the sphenoid bone, let's go back to the sphenoid bone for a moment. You can see it's right there in the center. You can see the outline of it. Part of it is up in the anterior cranial fossa. You can see the lesser wings are colored blue there. And the greater wings are down in the middle cranial fossa. Those are the parts that are colored orange. Um, and so there's the sphenoid bone sitting right dead center in the skull. So that's seven out of the eight bones. Finally, here's the eighth bone, the ethmoid bone. From this internal view of the skull, I can see a little bit of this bone. And notice that it's right here. I've circled it. It's right between uh, portions of the frontal bone. The frontal bone actually has a gap in it right above the nasal passages. Perhaps you can picture the orbits sitting right under those two lateral purple pieces. But the ethmoid bone forms uh, the separation between the brain and the, and the rest of the face right here in the nasal area. The picture of the ethmoid bone to the left shows the bone all by itself, um, but you see 
much more of the bone. The bone actually occupies quite a bit of the face as well as being part of the cranium. Let me take and put the frontal bone over the ethmoid there. So see how much of the ethmoid bone is hidden by the frontal bone. The center feature has many, many little holes in it, as you can see. And if you know the brain and the frontal lobe of the brain, you know there are two little olfactory tracks and bulbs that sit right over this area. And they actually sit down in the right and left sides there and drop nerves down into the nasal passages. And this, of course, is how we smell, or at least how the sense of smell gets from our nasal passages back up into the cranium and connected back into the brain. So this is the ethmoid bone from an internal aspect. Let's take the ethmoid bone now and look at it from a couple of other aspects. Here again on the right is the same view we were just looking at, but now if we tip it up, so we're looking at it from an anterior view, you can see it has a much different shape to it, doesn't it? Um, the bone on the left and the bone on the right are the same bone, but one is looking from above and one is looking from in front. If you match this to the skull, right, this is how it would fit. Let's shrink it down a little bit and let's move it right into place. So here's the ethmoid bone occupying all of that upper nasal area. And in fact, several features we can see. Um, I can see how the superior part of it would be where those olfactory bulbs would sit. And I can see how the frontal bone would be hiding much of that. But notice one of the sidewalls, the medial wall of the orbit is going to be formed by part of the ethmoid bone. And in the very dead center, you can see part of the nasal septum is going to be formed by the ethmoid bone. So um, nasal septum, the ethmoid bone also has hollow places in it. Between the eye and the center of the nose there are sinuses. As we said, the superior part of the nasal septum is there. Orbital plates in those little holes I showed you earlier, which are part of the olfactory foramina. So, although the ethmoid bone forms a whole lot of the facial structure in around the upper nasal passages, uh, we consider it as one of the cranial bones because there is a definite portion of it that separates the brain from the rest of the face. And so we include it as one of the eight cranial bones. This is the ethmoid bone. So the cranium, eight bones, the brain case, and just a quick naming of them, the frontal bone here, the two parietal bones, the occipital bone posteriorly, two temporal bones, a sphenoid bone in orange, and notice that you can see it as the back wall of the orbit there, and then in the nasal area, the ethmoid bone. So these are the bones of the skull.